you. So as Ben said, I'm going to speak a bit more specifically about a local deer control project we've got in place <coughs> in the Alpine National Park. Uh, but before I do, I'll just sort of put this project into context. This map shows uh, the eastern part of the, uh, uh, of the Parks Authority's state in the uh, eastern region. And it shows the numerous environmental programs that we've got in place, protecting the fantastic uh, natural values that we have uh, on the Parks Victoria estate, like uh, Mount Pygmy Possum, uh, Rush Tower Rock Wallabies. So this is one of those programs that's about conserving the special places we have uh, in the Parks Victoria estate. And we're talking about the, uh, the Alps, we're talking about the top of the catchments, um, these alpine environments, and these photos here show some alpine peatlands, which are a really important environment at the top of some of our major river systems. They're habitat for a number of endangered uh, species, including the alpine water skink that you can see here. They're also endangered ecological communities in their own right, protected under federal and state legislation, and play a really important role in uh, the hydrology of uh, our streams, uh, providing fresh water, removing sediment and nutrients from them. But these environments are under threat. Uh, you can see here some photos of alpine peatlands that have been impacted upon by deer, uh, wallowing, hugging, uh, trampling these uh, sensitive environments. And like uh, Dale, uh, Dale mentioned earlier, it's the sort of cumulative effect of uh, climate change, introduced species, weeds, pests, that are starting to uh, make these environments less resilient and, susceptible, and uh, more susceptible to uh, climate change and other impacts. So it's quite concerning and over the last 10 years we've certainly seen uh, greater indications of deer presence in the Alps and greater impacts on environments like our point of uh, Causing uh, rubbing impacts upon trees but also on some of our park infrastructure. Uh, and then of course impacts upon private land mm -hmm. on, and impacting on agricultural values and providing a, a road hazard. So this deer is actually on the Hume Highway. So back to the peatlands, I might ask you, Tom, to um, play the video that's um, been captured as part of this project we've got running. So this just shows you the type of damage that deer are, are causing. We know it's deer that are the culprits with some of those photos I showed before because you can see here getting in and, and mucking up a, an alpine peatland, an endangered community that's home to several endangered species and uh, making a real mess of it. So we thought we, we want to know more about what, what level of impact uh, deer are having on these environments. Uh, you know, are we at the, you know, are these impacts as much as we're going to see or are we just at the start and the impacts are going to increase over time? Uh, we wanted to know how widespread the impacts were, how severe they were. But we wanted to do it in a way where we could also uh, take some action as well and learn by doing. So we wanted to know what can we, what can we do to uh, mitigate these impacts. So we, set up a project um, called the Alpine National Park Deer Control Trial. Uh, at the, the start, as we were scoping this out, we had an expert workshop where we brought together experts in deer management, public land management, uh, conservation ecology from universities, from the Arthur Royal Institute, from uh, DELP. We also brought together some uh, hunters uh, from the ADA and the sporting shooters uh, with experience. And, and also workshop what we could do uh, to develop a, an innovative project to look at uh, managing deer impacts on alpine peatlands. Uh, and we came up with this key question. Can managing deer impacts on in parts of the Alpine National Park using ground shooting mitigate deer impacts on alpine peatlands? So we're quite specific about what we're looking, looking at. And the, and the reason is, uh, you know, if you look at the invasion curve here, part of the biosecurity um, approach to invasive species management that you, many of you will be familiar with, we're really talking about a widespread, well-established um, species, so we're very much in the asset protection space. And what we wanted, to, you know, we, we have numerous programs to protect alpine peatlands from willows, from fire, from the, the numerous other threats. We needed to, to see um, what we could do about managing deer as well. Uh, so uh, we realised as well that asset protection isn't necessarily about uh, a huge reduction in the population. It might just be a change in how deer use that part of the landscape and discouraging them from um, you know, causing these impacts on peatlands. So uh, with that workshop, we came up with a design which uh, is uh, quite, quite a sort of solid design. Where we've shown on the map here, you can see in red the alpine peatlands. 
and we've identified uh, two locations within the Alps where we'll focus our efforts. So uh, on the Bogart bike lanes, you can see up there in the north, and then in the southern Alps on the Howard and Wellington plains as well, near uh, the Coal Hay Hill. And, and within those two locations, we've got paired treatments. So we've got uh, two areas in each where we're act undertaking active deer control, and then two areas where we're just uh, you know, maintaining the status quo. And we've set up uh, monitoring in both those locations so we can understand uh, before we undertake our control actions, you know, what the environment's like in terms of uh, deer abundance and impact uh, on peatlands. Uh, but then uh, as we track through our control program, how those impacts are changing as well as the deer population itself. So it's a real sort of learning by doing type of approach. The control techniques we're using, we're, we're using anything that's available and we're throwing everything we can at it in those um, control areas. So, so far we've used stalking, stalking with gun dogs, spotlighting, uh, both vehicle based and, and on foot, glassing, which is um, uh, setting up covertly in, in areas where we can uh, sight deer at a distance in preferred habitat and um, take them out with pop powered weapons. Uh, using needles to try to attract deer, uh, a deer drive about trying to move deer into other areas where we can um, uh, get a good shot at them. Uh, using military grade night vision and uh, thermal imaging equipment. And the image there shows some of that. That's uh, quite a, a, a good technique that allows you a bit of time to set up a shot before the, the deer even know that you're there. Uh, and, and we're implementing this largely using volunteers, the, the Deer Association and the um, sporting shooters. Uh, and, and this as well helps us with, um, you know, as Ben mentioned, there's the social license involved with managing a species like that. Uh, Deer, but we've got a fantastic relationship with these groups and they're really supportive of the work we're doing and can really see the value we've heard around protecting these special places. So that's been really good, but we're also using our, our contract shooters as well. And we've got a, a, real, um, a really good team that will commence uh, work next week, um, mainly night, night operations using this type of equipment. And we're looking at uh, expanding our program to use hound hunting as well. So it's just some photos here of uh, some of the people in action. Uh, under all sorts of weather conditions, we've had really hot conditions, very cold conditions, windy, uh, full moon, no moon, all sorts of uh, conditions. So we're really just trying everything and, and learning what works well, what doesn't, and uh, uh, yeah, a very adaptive approach. So what are we measuring? We're looking at changes in the abundance and density of deer. We're using camera arrays to, to do this in a selection of those uh, uh, treatment areas that I've showed you. And so they look like this. You can see the uh, stars there on that map indicate the camera locations, and those arrays will show us, uh, uh, allow us to estimate the uh, density and abundance of deer and see how that changes over time. Uh, and then we're also looking at um, the activity of deer in alpine peatlands using a fecal pellet uh, index. So seeing how they're using those um, high value assets, I suppose. We're also looking, uh, most importantly, at, at impacts and how they may change over time. So we're looking at uh, the magnitude of impacts on peatlands, we're looking at the severity and, and density of impacts, so local scale but also broader scale, and we're doing that right across um, those locations I showed on the map. We're looking at things like wallows, uh, pugging, trail, cre uh, trail creation, trampling, the condition of vegetation, uh, and we're, we're looking at for individual wallows, how they might change over time. So are they sort of quite static or do they grow and change? And what's the ability for those to recover um, being some of the most sort of prominent impacts that we're seeing in peatlands? Uh, we also hope to establish exposure plots in the future as well. Uh, we're also measuring our, our effort to control deer. So we're looking at you know, catch per unit effort measures, uh, looking at the cost and then uh, evaluating what works well and what doesn't. So the progress, uh, so far we've had eight operations, as I said, in all types of conditions, in, in all weather. Uh, we've had from two to 18 volunteers uh, involved, and uh, you know, there's a, a real mix of skills with the volunteers, some really fantastic experienced people in, in amongst those groups, which is fantastic. Uh, and we've trialled a number of techniques, as I showed before. So far we've shot 25 deer, um, but we've seen around 54 additional deer um, that we weren't able to take a clean shot of. What have we learned so far? Um, this image here shows that the last image we caught of a deer uh, before the winter season last year. So once the snows come in, they do um, migrate down the hill and they won't return until December, January. 
So that information will help us target our operations for the coming year. Uh, the night operations appear the pro most promising, especially utilising that equipment that I've mentioned before. Uh, we've identified deer movement corridors. We've found that deer do frequent open areas, so they're not just in the, in the tree cover, they're coming out into the open and during the daytime as well. Uh, the volunteer commitment to the project is really high. We've got a great resource there that we're working really closely with. Uh, but deer management is difficult. Uh, and you need to be adaptive, you need to be innovative, uh, and yeah, that what we're doing, you know, it's yet to be seen whether, whether it will work, but we're keen to, um, that's why I've got the monitoring in place so we can understand what uh, is working, what's not, and adapt our program. So the next steps is uh, that review and adaptation, uh, expand the program into the Southern Alps, which will commence this year, uh, look at hound hunting, uh, trying to increase the self-sufficiency of some of our volunteer operations to make it more sustainable. Uh, we're aware of the impacts uh, on private land and on agriculture and we want to work with the community to um, look at how we might manage some of those in interface areas so that's something we want to keep up with this company as well. And, and as I said before, it's all about learning um, by doing so. It's going to be very much adaptive as we go through. And I'd just like to thank all our partners in this project um, and, and the other people in the room here that have been involved like uh, Elaine and, and Keith and, and Charlie and Tom.